This program contains discussion of self-harm and suicide. Tonight on Four Corners, we take you into the lives of Australia's kids and their journey through adolescence and ask, why are they feeling so stressed? I worry about some things like terrorism, racism and like poverty around the world and some diseases. Uh, I find I used to see a lot of like ISIS, like there used to be a lot of bombings with them and everything. I find that horrible. I, find, I just think, why did I do that? What did they do to you? I always look at, compare myself to other people and look at others and think, wow, why can't I be like that? I noticed, like, girls would just think of guys as sex objects and they just want to be with them because of their masculinity and their body type. It really does have to look like you're living this perfect life and everything in your life is perfect and there's you haven't got a worry everything's like cute and happy and there's nothing really wrong when in reality there is but you don't want people to know that fathers tell boys to you know suck it up just keep moving on don't worry about it it's not going to affect you but it does all that up eventually and you can just crack you might think Australian kids have never had it so good. On average, they're probably healthier, wealthier and better educated than ever before. They're also more exposed to the world. In this global village, there are very few secrets, very few filters. How, for instance, are children supposed to process an event like the weekend's Paris attacks? That's just one factor contributing to the anxiety and depression now at very high levels amongst our kids. One in four say they worry about the future all the time. In this quite special Four Corners program, we ask a wide range of young Australians from 12 to 19 why they feel so much pressure. Their responses are frank, sometimes funny, often heartbreaking, always illuminating. The reporter is Quentin McDermott. It's a balmy evening at a suburban oval and hundreds of boys and girls are playing football. Hi guys, hey. I'm, I'm Quentin. Hi, I'm Ben. Ben, nice to meet you. I'm Zach. Zach, good to meet you. Hey Quentin, I'm Cameron. Yep, Cameron, good to meet you. Sam. Sam, good to meet you too. So tell me about the game this evening. Who, who are you playing and how many are aside? The All Stars. Yeah. And, and we're playing six aside. Yeah. Right. What's your favourite team? Manchester United, hands down. Yes. <laughs> Sam, Cameron, Zach and Ben are 12 and 13 years old. They live in an outer metropolitan suburb and go to a local Anglican school. For boys so young, their worries are surprisingly grown up. What are your top three concerns? What if you said, look, these are the three things that are worrying me most in life, what would they be? Um, probably doing well in school, getting a good job and providing for a family if I have one. My number one concern would be education, getting a job and all of that. My number two concern would be family and friends. And at this stage, number three would um, probably be soccer. <laughs> Playing for Manchester United? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First one is probably getting a good job. Number two, probably getting enough money to actually support my children when I get older. And number three is probably, um, probably staying close to my family. We socialise our boys from being very, very little, that it's all up to them. You know, even though we've had the women's movement and women can be brain surgeons or whatever now, 
things haven't moved a great deal for our boys and, and they feel the weight of that responsibility very heavily. A generation ago, kids like these would have been shielded from the horrors of the wider world, but not anymore. Now, with the explosion in social media and news online, children's horizons have expanded immeasurably and sometimes frighteningly. Take the refugee incident in Europe. Um, I found that like quite upsetting to see people having to flee their homes and like parents being split up from their kids. It's pretty heart wrenching. I worry about some things like terrorism, racism, and like poverty around the world and some diseases. Ben, how do you react to the news? Uh I find I used to see a lot of, like, ISIS on it. Like, there used to be a lot of bombings with them and everything. I find that horrible. I, find, I just think, why did they do that? What did they do to you? There's a very clear sense that they feel they're about to be handed a poison chalice. And that is, I think, because of the immersive amount of news that we have now, the 24-7 cycle, where they see environmental degradation. You know, we see IS, we see the floods of migrants. And so they're left in that place of pain and bewilderment and these issues being much larger than they, they can personally deal with. Maggie Hamilton is a social researcher who specialises in child and adolescent development. In the last few years, she's interviewed hundreds of kids and spoken at length to teachers, doctors, parents and researchers. I saw some really disturbing things. Um, we're now seeing children as young as seven having to go into counselling for anxiety issues, eating issues, depression. One major cause of anxiety and depression in kids is family conflict and parents separating. I would like to have a positive and, ha positive and happy family in the future. Ben's parents split up when he was four. I don't remember much, but I remember, like, m my dad leaving me. Like, I remember that. I remember that. I remember how my mum and dad used to fight. How did it affect you emotionally at the time? It affected me a fair bit once I got to realise that's what happened. It, it affected me for like half a year. But then I got over it because that, that's about when I started playing soccer. And that's when I started to get over things. That's how, that's why I get over things by playing soccer. Because I learned to get over like my dad and my mum leaving. And how are you now? I'm fine with it. Like, I see my dad at least once a week and it's good. I haven't seen, I haven't seen them fight in ages. So, yeah, it's good. Olivia is 12. She lives with her mother and younger brother, Will. Their parents are separated and Olivia has just changed schools. You weren't very happy at your old school, were you? No. Tell me about that. I was bullied. I was teased because I wore glasses. Um, I was... Girls would, like, make me buy them, like, use my money to buy them, like, treats, like, like, like lollies and stuff from the school canteen um, and they'd say if I didn't they would like for example bite their arm and have a bite mark and then go tell the teacher that I bit them so I felt that I really had to go and buy things for them. Bullying's been around forever, but it now has an added dimension, social media. There was cyberbullying, um, like some girls were being called names over the internet by people who were supposed to be their best friends. Um, and I know in, even in like year four, 
things were being posted online about other girls and that was made people like really like upset and I love One of the things we're missing in the whole argument around bullying and cyberbullying is how we grow our, our children up to really be able to navigate what is an incredibly complex world. To me, I think emotional intelligence should be one of the top things on the curriculum we're teaching because that's the, the reality of what's needed for tomorrow's world. What do you want to go on? Mm. Oh, here you go. Okay. Olivia and her friend Lily are doing well at school, but still feel the pressure of other people's expectations. <laughs> like I put like apple juice. Well, in private schools, there's, you know, teachers are always saying, you have to do well, you know, your parents are paying so much money for you to come here. It's, you have to, you have to pass this test, you have to get A's, you have to succeed. And I know lots of people, there is a lot of pressure from a particularly the especially bright children. Um, they, there's a lot of pressure from their families that sometimes it's like too much for them. Mm. So Ella, okay. have you seen her newest video? I don't know, maybe. Yeah, she I'm did this sure. really cool haul and she had this really pretty dress and I was like, oh, oh my God, I need to find that somewhere. Hello everyone, today I am going to be doing my July favorites. June I had a good reshuffle of my makeup bag, but through July I kind of stuck to the same things. Um, if you watch my second channel, you'll notice I pretty much have the same makeup look every day. You watch which second was a channel? gold eye. Yeah, um, sometimes her vlogs yeah. are so gold interesting. Eye. Yeah, I watch them too. Yeah. Away from school, peer pressure has never been more intense. Next page. Yep, yeah, that one. Which one? This is the pressure to have the newest trends and be trendy and look, you know, just look tumblery, which is like, that's everyone's sort of aim in our generation. That's so cool. Okay. For a regular girl like Olivia, it's almost impossible to keep up. <laughs> so I'm not surprised. <laughs> at private schools, it's, <laughs> it's almost like a crime to shop at stores like Target or Big W, like stores like that, um, Kmart. Um, yeah, it's, it's like, it's, it, you just don't do it. Um, you know, every now and again, Maybe. they'll get away with wearing something from a store like Target. Um, you know, you cut off the tags because no one can know. It's pretty much like the same thing that would happen 40 years ago. Oh, you're not wearing that, so you're not cool. It's just like the same thing, but now it's escalating to a point where when you have social media, you can post pictures about where, what you're wearing and then people pretty much see your outfit for every single day of the week. So it, it turns out to be something where people are seeing every single aspect of other people's life. Those are so cute. They look like pumpkins or something. The constant yeah, struggle so to fit in makes Olivia anxious. Style. What brands, you know, what, what, what are you expected to yeah. have? Um, everyone will generally have, like, the really expensive Converse, the, the, like, the leather ones, usually in white. That's, like, the staple item in every, like, pretty much every private school girl's wardrobe. They go in the dark. That's like, so bags, cool. they'll have longchamp bags, um, triangle bikinis, um, Victoria's Secret, like, body sprays, EOS lip balms, um, Marc Jacob, like jeans or what, and like watches. Um, people use like, like expensive, like so Victoria's Secret or something like makeup bags as their pencil cases. They go and think that that's cool. But really it's kind of as if like, what message are they trying to send that they're trying to act like a, like an, 21 year old like a tw somebody who's gone and they're a young adult like literally adult they're going and buying adult things trying to act really grow grown up when some of these girls are still 11. I think one of the the really tragic things about this is not only the anxiety it's creating but what I saw was the huge amount of life energy that these kids put into this in their desperation to belong. And this is energy that could be going into having a life and having experiences that are going to develop them as a human being. Just in terms of your general appearance, Olivia, do you worry about that, about what you're gonna wear every morning? Yes. 
Um, when I have to pick out an outfit to go somewhere, even if it's just to walk my dog, in, just in case I, I see someone that I'll, I know, I'll change outfits like 10 times and I'll do my hair 20 times and I need to, I feel like I do need to have the perfect outfit and have my hair looking like really nice. And social media doesn't help. It's like Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, YouTube, etc. There's not really a winner, but it is a competition in a way to get have the most followers on Instagram. And you've got to have the perfect picture. You do feel um, like it really does have to be perfect. It really does have to look like you're living this perfect life and everything in your life is perfect and there's you haven't got a worry everything's like cute and happy and there's nothing really wrong when in reality there is but you don't want people to know that and it's just really scary being like a 13 year old girl and knowing that people are kind of pressured in to do this because oh yeah the popular girls are doing it so if I don't do this then people aren't gonna like me Alright, so you're gonna continue on from your book, write a diary entry, or um, you're gonna pick up on the um, on the, on the assessment task notification. It's a Monday evening in a middle class inner city suburb. We've taken control. In separate locations linked by the internet, Dylan and Dimitri and Liam and Lewis are playing Call of Duty. Oh no! No, but everybody, don't get any more kills. Don't get any more kills. Says, says. Oh, you got fast hands, cold blooded. This is how many fifteen year old boys play games now on the couch and remotely. How am I still alive? Let's take control. Oh. Dylan, uh, are you allowed to play this game? Um, no, I'm not. Um, my mum is quite protective on what games I play, and um, she doesn't like the idea of killing people or violence for entertainment. Um, so that's the big reason why I'm not allowed to play those games. How do you feel about it? Um, I'm quite annoyed because, um, I can't spend that time with my friends online, um, as I'm not playing those games. Wow, that's so dodgy. Gaming cuts into study time and leaves some boys sleep deprived and anxious. Oh, I got my, um, marks back today for my test. Geography? No, for, um... I have no time for homework. The experts say that gaming's not all bad. Gaming in and of itself can be a very socially engaging activity. It can teach you great skills like problem solving, thinking outside of the box, um, social connectedness. So there's a whole host of things that can go with gaming when it's done in a way that builds a community. Jane Burns has researched the use of gaming in supporting anxious boys. Gaming could actually be one way in which you could encourage young men to support each other, seek help, talk about their issues and problems, and work together to solve them. The impulse not to talk about personal issues is ingrained in many boys from an early age. Do you feel there's this pressure on, on boys to, you know, man up and not not be emotional. Yeah, it's being passed down through the generations. Fathers tell boys to, you know, suck it up, just keep moving on, don't worry about it, it's not gonna affect you. But it does all add up eventually, and you can just crack. For boys, I think they think it's more masculine not to. And it turns out boys are as worried about body image as girls. How do girls regard boys? Oh, um... 
I noticed like girls would just think of guys as sex objects and they just want to be with them because of their masculinity and their body type. And that's like, they don't feel any real love for them. They just want them because of their body. Masculinity plays, plays a big, pretty big role. Muscles. Um, muscles, yeah. Muscles are a big thing. Fitness. With girls, fitness and muscles. If you have a good body, you have a lot of muscles on you, mm. you're, you're marked as good looking. And um, that's always, at our age, a big factor when girls are looking at boys. If you have a girlfriend or if you don't have a girlfriend, are there big pressures on you? Yeah, there is. You've got a lot that you have to do to keep up the relationship. Talking, you have to keep talking, um, meeting up outside, and having a girlfriend, again, seems it's like it adds to your social status. Fitting in with the world around me and having a good social status, maybe being girlfriend, wife in the future, <laughs> something like that, <laughs> that'd be pretty good. What does fitting in mean? I'm interested in this. To me, I don't want to be excluded from everybody and do different things. I do want to be close to people who do similar things to me so I can fit into their like social group, their sports and all that. I just feel like that fitting in would probably make my life, I don't know, more enjoyable, I guess. In a sprawling outer metropolitan suburb away from the bright lights, these 16 and 17 year olds are chasing their dreams. I've been dancing since I was two years old and I've never stopped and I've loved every single minute of it. When I dance, I feel like I feel like I can fly, like it's amazing. Training here takes 10 or 15 hours a week and juggling the demands of home, school and dance can be stressful. For these kids, dance isn't just a passion, it's a much needed pressure valve. Does it take you out of the rest of your life? Yeah. It gives me a break from situations at home, situations at school. And I forget about school together because that's always stressful. Yeah, it's just a place where I can be free and happy with all my friends. We're like a big family. Um, we support each other, we encourage each other through everything and it allows me to relieve stress from any family or school pressures I have and I can just be myself. It releases the pressure a lot and that's why I come and also because I love it. <laughs> Gabrielle, Brendan, Teresa, Claudia and Emily all dream of a life on stage. <laughs> But outside the studio, they're brought down to earth by mountains of homework and looming exams. So how's it going? It's all right. Are you going to get this done by tomorrow? Well, it's due by tomorrow. So how long is it going to take? I don't know. I think about an hour. I'll be done. Mm-hmm. But what about after you've done maths, what else have you got? I've got PH and then dance, but I can't do that because I have to film them. And then religion, which I haven't started, and I should probably start. Teresa. <sighs> How are you going at maths? I'm good. Yeah, I'm in the top class. But mum doubts me and thinks I'm horrible at it. So I'm going to fail every test, apparently, to her. Oh, it is the book. You're right. Brendan's mum is a high school principal. 
Let's just go over what you've missed this week mm -hmm. um, so that we can just get a plan of what we've got to do. Yep. So, what about English? Where are you up to? Just watched the movie of my... Oh, we're halfway through the movie. Okay, so maybe what about seeing you missing Monday because yes. of the ensembles? What about if you plan tonight that you watch that? Yep. Okay, so watch. Okay, and art. Doing art at the moment. Uh, just got a lot of notes. Lots of notes. Um, just of practice, study. Okay. To do. Would you want to stick those in? And I'll start with just doing some highlights on that. Um, and then we can go over this together. Yep. Yeah? Mm -hmm. oh, I want to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you seem to me to be happy and confident, and that's fantastic. Do you ever get anxious, though, about how much you've got on your plate? Yes, um, it's all happy on the outside. Sometimes um, on the inside it's very hard. There's so many dances, you have to remember. And then at the same time, you've got all your schoolwork with all your teachers nagging you and just started year 12, so um, it's going to be very hard in the long term. Um, but in, hopefully it will get done, but yes, it is very stressing. Emily and her family live out on the rural fringe of the city. While her passion is dance, her dad, who owns a scissor lift business, has other ideas. You get a marinade? Yep. Got my little helper down here. What's your, your plans after the HSC? What are you going to do after that? Get a job, get some money. Mm. You know, oh, that'd be nice. Do you dance? <laughs> Dancing, yeah. obviously. Number one priority. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's about it. Okay, and if dancing doesn't uh, eventuate and make a career out of it, um, it's uh, come and work for Dad, eh? Ah. Hey? Is it? Yeah. Is it really? I have got yeah. buckets and buckets of filing to be done. Mm. So, all with your name on Dream it. Dream come true. <laughs> Aren't you <Yeah>. lucky? Yeah. <laughs> Although these dancers enjoy the fun and friendship, the competition can feed their insecurities. Are there any other particular stresses or anxieties in your life? I think social anxieties. I always look at, compare myself to other people and look at others and think, wow, why can't I be like that? When looking at, like, stuff online, I see lots of pressures from other people to do what they're doing, be like them, but then I have to calm myself down and think, wait, I'm unique, I'm myself. Sometimes I feel when I compare myself to others that I don't look great and I'm getting too big in areas or on my body or something and certain features aren't right. And it's, it's really horrible, but yeah, that's what I think. One of my friends that actually went to my school, she ended up with anorexia, which is absolutely horrible. And um, we were all there for her and everything like that, but she had to end up leaving my school because of that. What are we having tonight, Gabrielle? Mexican. Okay. Mexican ones, yeah, come on. Tell me what you want. As well as being pressured to look perfect, some girls are pressured by boys who learn about sex through pornography. I thought I could get away with it because I tried to wash it, like, really well, but yes. it didn't work. So I know there's some boys that do think that, like, or girls are just, like, kind of like sex toys, which is horrible, and they then go to parties and treat girls like that, and that's where um, you kind of have to be careful in a way like girls especially, but that's horrible. While all these kids have normal day-to-day -day anxieties, one dancer, Claudia, has really struggled. My parents got divorced this year and it wasn't an easy divorce either. And I've got a little sister, she's 13 years old. And when my parents divorced, I felt like I had to step up. I stepped up to be like, like a second mum to my sister. So, very strong for her and it got to the point where it was re really bad and she was going through like a depressed, like she was depressed for quite a while and none of my parents knew, only I knew. I 
I was not motivated for anything. I couldn't get up. I didn't want to do anything. Like, even when I had my outdoor activities, like, it would be a struggle to go to them because I couldn't find the motivation to go. But, yeah, I got through that, so... Who helped you get through it? Oh, definitely my sister, 100%. She's <laughs> always there for me through thick and thin, and I'll always be there for her, and she will for me. I know that for sure. It all took its toll on Claudia as well. I put on um, a lot of weight. I was not so much motivated as what I usually are. Um, school, my half yearly exams didn't go too well. Um, and yeah, just everything went downhill. But as soon as I hit term three, I really realised that I've got to focus on myself as well because I'm starting year 12 and I've only got one year left till I go into the future. So I cracked down on what I eat, I um, cracked down on my fitness, I really stepped up at school, handed my assessments in. Um, yeah, I really like, I'm ha quite happy with myself at the moment. On Australia's eastern seaboard in a small coastal town live these four 15 year old schoolmates. It's an area of high unemployment and broken dreams and their teachers are pushing them hard to succeed. Elora and Emma feel the pressure to do well at school. Being in like a top class, it puts like pressure on you to do like good and all the teachers put like pressure on you. I'm in the top class as well, so I feel pressure to like do really well and stuff and I get a lot of pressure off mum as well because she always wants me to do really good and there's like this really smart kid in my class <laughs> and I always, like, I can never be as smart as him and it's really frustrating, but yeah. Does that get you down? Yeah, it does. And lately I've been getting even worse and it's really sad, <laughs> yeah. Tarquin feels the pressure just to keep up. I'm not in the, the smartest class out of all of them, so like, assignments and just trying to do work in class, I kind of feel a bit like pressured because I really don't know much about what they're talking about to me. So I get a bit nervous and anxious about what if they like get angry at me because I haven't done it, but then I don't want to say them. I actually don't know how to do it. So I get scared and try to sit there and be quiet. Ethan constantly worries about his weight. It's hard having like such good looking friends who've got like the best bodies and like just swimming with like going to the pool with them and swimming and then they're all getting like shirtless photos and bikini photos and it's just so awkward like I'll just sneak around the back get my shirt back on and like get back into the photos but um, I've I'm doing stuff about it like I've lost seven kilos so tell me why you felt the need to lose seven kilos um, I felt the need to lose weight, I guess. It's because I just thought it was embarrassing to be around my friends when they were so, like, they had good bodies and I just felt like crap about mine. And seeing other people, like, people sharing photos on, like, Facebook and stuff, it's like, all anyone wants. And then it's like, people with abs and, like, the jaw lines and stuff. And I don't know, it just made me feel like no one would, like, I'd grow old and just be lonely. But, um, I think at the moment I'm all right about how I am because of, like, again, my friend's support. It isn't just school and body image worrying these kids. Scratch beneath the surface and far darker fears and anxieties emerge. Tarquin, when he was little, was traumatised by family conflict in his home. I didn't really feel, like, safe there, as most kids would. I would just always get anxious about if I've done something wrong, like, what would happen? So I'd just go to the skate park or just to go away by myself for ages and just would try to like, forget about everything and just be happy, just move on. Like many children experiencing family breakdown, Tarquin blamed himself. 
I just never wanted to be there. Like it was this really scary time. Like it was just everything I do, I just was scared that it was wrong. And even if it wasn't my fault, I would still get the blame. And I was just like so nervous. And then I'd get like depressed about why have I wrecked everything? And then I'd go down on myself thinking it's all my fault when it wasn't, it was actually theirs. Tarquin's girlfriend, Elora, has been his rock. It's just every time like I'm sad, like she'll just be there to talk to me and like try to get me through stuff. So I wouldn't like always just think that I should just leave and like not come back, you know? Like she'd just make me think that I actually deserve to live here. And... Um, I feel like it's really hard watching people that like you care about go through things like that. And um, <clears throat> I have a few friends that are, like, sort of in the same situation and, like, um, so, I don't know, I just try and be there for them and always offer, like, for them to come over whenever they need to and, like, yeah, so I just try and make it better. Among Elora's age group, self-harm has become commonplace. How many girls are out there around Australia harming themselves in this way? I think there's like a lot more than people expect. Like, like I've seen heaps of girls, like, and I've just been here for like two years, I think. And like, and that's only the ones that will actually you actually see and you actually know about. Elora and Emma have found a huge number of websites yeah, devoted to self-harm. Top 10 ways to self-harm. Burning of skin. Hair pulling out. Do people actually do all this stuff? All our friends do. Cutting. I always see her with the cuts on. Two years ago, Elora was so appalled by what was going on around her that she made a film about it. Will you still love me when I'm no longer young and beautiful? Will you still love me when I got nothing? Wrong? Elora was 13 years old when she acted the part of a girl who harms herself. Is that the pressure you think that young girls feel that they're not beautiful enough, that, that their body isn't beautiful enough, they don't look good enough, and is that what drives them to harm themselves? I feel like with social media especially, like you have to look a certain way or be a type of person, and I feel like a lot of girls are really unhappy with themselves and just everything, and so it leads to that. When you and I Elora and Emma showed their film to an audience of a hundred people at a community event. While the movie was playing, they were just like dead silent the whole way through until it ended. And a few ladies like came up to me and they were crying and like because their daughter had been through it. Anxieties unresolved in childhood can lead to a spiral of self-destructive behaviour. Ellie and Alicia survived their adolescent years, but only just. I didn't know what it was like to be a cool Australian girl. And I felt very pressured to be something I wasn't. And it was just, it was bizarre to sort of like look around me and like feel like I was just so important imperfect compared to everyone and everyone else seemed to have their lives so together and I just felt like I was just sort of a mess of a person. At 14, Alicia developed an eating disorder. And it was so much easier to just not eat. I felt so much better about myself. I felt like I was perfect. I was doing something good for myself and it was very easy to, you know, skip meals because mum and dad never expected this of me. Did social media play a part in this? 
incredibly. On you know Tumblr, there's people romanticising eating disorders and self-harm, like they're completely normal things that teenagers are going through. And the thing is, they are, but social media talks about them in the wrong way. They were like, well, they're called sort of like pro-ana sites. And it's where people sort of like promote anorexia and literally people write lists on how to be anorexic, like steps to being anorexic, and I would follow it like the Bible. In year nine, at different schools, both girls started cutting themselves. How long were you self-harming for? Like, like three years. Yeah, from like beginning of year nine up until end of year 11, maybe. Self-harm is very much on the rise. In fact, a number of years ago, so much so it was dubbed the new anorexia. It has become so common um, out there that the kids themselves don't see it as dysfunctional. So if you say to them, you know, 20 years ago, people didn't do this, they look at you as if you've got two heads. I noticed, I think it was probably in year eight, that I started being really unhappy. Like, I didn't really enjoy anything. Um, and when I was 14, um, I started self-harming just to cope with it all. And then once I started doing it, it just became addictive. And the one thing that I would turn to um, whenever I was sad and I just couldn't cope with the way I was feeling. It definitely gave me a rush, like it gave me a feeling of almost being like invincible, like, wow, look at this, like, look what I can do to myself, like, I'm still alive, like, it was just like the sudden flood of emotions, and yeah, it was definitely what kept me going. What would you do the following morning when you had to go to school? It was, it was really crazy, because like, I'd do it at night, and it was just like, I was completely, like, it was all I wanted to do. And I'd wake up the next morning and, like, look at myself and there'd be, you know, like, blood on my pyjamas and blood on my sheets and I'd like, look at myself and be like, what have I done? Like, why on earth did I think this was a good idea? Like, I was embarrassed. I'd cover it up. I'd wear bandages to school because obviously I didn't want anyone to know. Anecdotally, we are certainly seeing more young people presenting with self-harming behaviours and we certainly know from the large-scale epidemiological studies that have been done around the world that if you're experiencing depression, anxiety, drug and alcohol problems, eating disorders, and you're self-harming, you're at greater risk for suicide. Alicia and Ellie met in the same psych ward after attempting suicide. Both girls came to realise how taking their lives would have devastated their families. I guess the only thing that sort of kept me here was my brother and just the idea of that I didn't want to leave him alone in the world. Like, that was just such a selfish thing to do and sort of, like, you know, the repercussions it would have on my family. The main issue for me was that it's not fair on my family um, and I knew how much it would just ruin my parents and my brothers. Only now is Alicia coming to terms with the anxiety she felt about her place in the world. You know, you turn on the news and there's just all this horrible stuff happening and you go on Facebook and there are stories of, like, suicide and car crashes and, you know, everywhere you look there seems to be so much despair. And I think there's a lot of pressure put on our, on our generation, but I think there's sort of, like, this pressure put on us that we need to sort of, you know, we need to fix the world. And, like, I know personally for me, I'd sit and I'd watch the news and I'd look at these starving children and I'd look at, like, the state of the economy, I'd look at the mess that the world was in, I'd sort of feel like I had to change all of this and I felt so alone in doing that. And I think that people forget that, you know, they do have the ability to make that change and they don't have to feel so alone in the world. Most kids do survive their anxieties, and most go on to live a full and happy life. But it can be a daunting journey. There are no easy answers, but maybe listening more closely to what our kids are trying to tell us would be a good place to start. Their voice is just as important 
as a scientist. Their voice is just as important as a CEO because they have solutions that they know are going to resonate with other young people. Is there any advice you would give to parents in particular? Yeah, just ask them how their day was. It's not even that hard or that difficult. Just honestly ask them, how was school? How are you feeling? How are your friends? Um, is there anything that's stressing you out? Um, what can we do to solve this? I have a mother who I can talk to anything about and no matter what it is, even if I've done something wrong or something, I can always talk to her because I know that she's like there and she cares and no matter what, we'll get through it. And I feel like a lot of the kids don't have that with their parents. Always be by their side to help them when they need you. Let them not do what they want, but don't wrap them up in cotton wool. Yeah, not wrapping them up as much as it is important to wrap them up in love. There's another message in this for all those kids caught in the intensity and loneliness of a problem they feel they can't share. You're not alone and these issues can be managed. Next week on Four Corners, our final program for the year, we look at the making of Australia's youngest ever terrorist and the men who are influencing the next generation of homegrown jihadists. Until then, good night. If this program has raised issues of concern, you might like to call one of these numbers. And just be lonely, but um, I think at the moment I'm all right about how I am because of, like again, my friend's support. It isn't just school and body image worrying these kids. Scratch beneath the surface and far darker fears and anxieties emerge. Tarquin, when he was little, was traumatised by family conflict in his home. I didn't really feel, like, safe there, as most kids would. I would just always get anxious about if I've done something wrong, like, what would happen? So I'd just go to the skate park or just to go away by myself for ages and just would try to like, forget about everything and just be happy, just move on. Like many children experiencing family breakdown, Tarquin blamed himself. I just never wanted to be there. Like, it was this really scary time. Like, it was just everything I do, I just was scared that it was wrong and even if it wasn't my fault, I would still get the blame and I was just like so nervous and then I'd get like depressed about why have I wrecked everything and then I'd go down on myself thinking it's all my fault when it wasn't, it was actually theirs. Tarquin's girlfriend Elora has been his rock. It's just every time like I'm sad like she'll just be there to talk to me and like try to get me through stuff so I wouldn't like always just think that I should just leave and like not come back you know. like. She just make me think that I actually deserve to live here. And... Yeah. Um, I feel like it's really hard watching people that like you care about go through things like that. And um, <clears throat> I have a few friends that are like sort of in the same situation, and like, um, so I don't know. I just try and be there for them, and always offer like for them to come over whenever they need to, and like, yeah. So I just try and make it better. Among Elora's age group, self-harm has become commonplace. How many girls are out there around Australia harming themselves in this way? 
I think there's like a lot more than people expect. Like, like I've seen heaps of girls, like, and I've just been here for like two years, I think. And like, and that's only the ones that will actually that you actually see and you actually know about. Yeah, that's what I think. One of my friends that actually went to my school, she ended up with anorexia, which is absolutely horrible. And um, we were all there for her and everything like that, but she had to end up leaving my school because of that. What are we having tonight, Gabrielle? Mexican. Okay. It's Mexican ones, it's yeah. Wednesday. Come on. Tell me what you want. As well as being pressured to look perfect, some girls are pressured by boys who learn about sex through pornography. I thought I could get away with it because I tried to wash it like really well, but yes. it didn't work. So I know there's some boys that do think that like oh, girls are just like kind of like sex toys, which is horrible, and they then go to parties and treat girls like that, and that's where um, you kind of have to be careful in a way. Like girls especially, but that's horrible. While all these kids have normal day-to-day -day anxieties, one dancer, Claudia, has really struggled. My parents got divorced this year and it wasn't an easy divorce either. And I've got a little sister, she's 13 years old, and when my parents divorced, I felt like I had to step up. I stepped up to be like like a second mum to my sister. So very strong for her and it got to the point where it was re really bad and she was going through like a depressed, like she was depressed for quite a while and none of my parents knew, only I knew. I was not motivated for anything. I couldn't get up, I didn't want to do anything. Like, even when I had my outdoor activities, like, it would be a struggle to go to them because I couldn't find the motivation to go. But, yeah, I got through that, so. Who helped you get through it? Oh, definitely my sister, 100%. She's <laughs> always there for me through thick and thin, and I'll always be there for her and she will for me. I know that for sure. It all took its toll on Claudia as well. I put on um, a lot of weight. I was not so much motivated as what I usually are. Um, school, my half yearly exams didn't go too well. Um, and yeah, just everything went downhill. But as soon as I hit term three, I really realized that I've got to focus on myself as well because I'm starting year 12 and I've only got one year left till I go into the future. So I cracked down on what I eat, I um, cracked down on my fitness, I really stepped up at school, handed my assessments in. Um, yeah, I really like, I'm ha quite happy with myself at the moment. On Australia's eastern seaboard in a... That's just one factor contributing to the anxiety and depression now at very high levels amongst our kids. One in four say they worry about the future all the time. In this quite special Four Corners program, we ask a wide range of young Australians from 12 to 19 why they feel so much pressure. Their responses are frank, sometimes funny, often heartbreaking, always illuminating. The reporter is Quentin McDermott. It's a balmy evening at a suburban oval and hundreds of boys and girls are playing football. Hi guys, hey. I'm, I'm Quentin. Hi, hi Ben. Ben, nice to meet you. I'm Zach. Zach, good to meet you. Hey Quentin, I'm Cameron. Yep, Cameron, good to meet you. Sam. Sam, good to meet you too. So tell me about the game this evening. Who, who are you playing and how many aside? side? The All Stars. Yeah. And, and I'm playing six aside. Yeah. Right. What's your favourite team? Manchester United, hands down. Yeah. <laughs> Sam, Cameron, Zach and Ben are 12 and 13 years old. They live in an outer metropolitan suburb and go to a local Anglican school. For boys so young, their worries are surprisingly grown up. 
What are your top three concerns? What if you said, look, these are the three things that are worrying me most in life, what would they be? Um, probably doing well in school, getting a good job and providing for a family if I have one. My number one concern would be education, getting a job and all of that. My number two concern would be family and friends. And at this stage, number three would um, probably be soccer. <laughs> Playing for Manchester United? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First one is probably getting a good job. Number two, probably getting enough money to actually support my children when I get older. And number three is probably, um, probably staying close to my family. We socialise our boys from being very, very little, that it's all up to them. You know, even though we've had the women's movement and women can be brain surgeons or whatever now, things haven't moved a great deal for our boys and, and they feel the weight of that responsibility very heavy. People and look at others and think, wow, why can't I be like that? I know like, girls would just think of guys as sex objects and they just want to be with them because of their masculinity and their body type. It really does have to look like you're living this perfect life and everything in your life is perfect and there's, you haven't got a worry. Everything's like cute and happy and there's nothing really wrong when in reality there is, but you don't want people to know that. Fathers tell boys to, you know, suck it up, just keep moving on, don't worry about it, it's not gonna affect you but it does all add up eventually, and you can just crack. You might think Australian kids have never had it so good. On average, they're probably healthier, wealthier, and better educated than ever before. They're also more exposed to the world. In this global village, there are very few secrets, very few filters. How, for instance, are children supposed to process an event like the weekend's Paris attacks? That's just one factor contributing to the anxiety and depression now at very high levels amongst our kids. One in four say they worry about the future all the time. In this quite special Four Corners program, we ask a wide range of young Australians from 12 to 19 why they feel so much pressure. Their responses are frank, sometimes funny, often heartbreaking, always illuminating. The reporter is Quentin McDermott. It's a balmy evening at a suburban oval and hundreds of boys and girls are playing football. Hi guys, hey. I'm, I'm Quentin. Hi, I'm Ben. Ben, nice to meet you. I'm Zach. Zach, good to meet you. Hey Quentin, I'm Cameron. Yep, Cameron, good to meet you. Sam. Sam, good to meet you too. So tell me about the game this evening. Who, who are you playing and how many aside? The All Stars. Yeah. And, and we're playing six aside. Yeah. Right. What's your favourite team? Manchester United, hands down. Yes. <laughs> Sam, Cameron, Zach, and Ben are 12 and 13 years old. They live in an outer metropolitan suburb and go to a local Anglican school. For boys so young, their worries are surprisingly grown up. What are your top three concerns? What if you said, look, these are the three things that are worrying me most in life, what would they be? Um, probably doing well in school, getting a good job and... There used to be a lot of bombings with them and everything. I find that horrible. I, find... I just think, why did I do that? What did they do to you? I always look at, compare myself to other people and look at others and think, wow, why can't I be like that? I know, like, girls would just think of guys as sex objects and they just want to be with them because of their masculinity and their body type. It really does have to look like you're living this perfect life and everything in your life is perfect and there's, you haven't got a worry, everything's 
like cute and happy and there's nothing really wrong when in reality there is, but you don't want people to know that. Fathers tell boys to, you know, suck it up, just keep moving on, don't worry about it, it's not gonna affect you. But it does all add up eventually and you can just crack. You might think Australian kids have never had it so good. On average, they're probably healthier, wealthier and better educated than ever before. They're also more exposed to the world. In this global village, there are very few secrets, very few filters. How, for instance, are children supposed to process an event like the weekend's Paris attacks? That's just one factor contributing to the anxiety and depression now at very high levels amongst our kids. One in four say they worry about the future all the time. In this quite special Four Corners program, we ask a wide range of young Australians from 12 to 19 why they feel so much pressure. Their responses are frank, sometimes funny, often heartbreaking, always illuminating. The reporter is Quentin McDermott. It's a balmy evening at a suburban oval, and hundreds of boys and girls are playing football. Hi guys, hey. I'm, I'm Quentin. Hi, hi Ben. Ben, nice to meet you. I'm Zach. Zach, good to meet you. Hey Quentin, I'm Cameron. Yep, Cameron, good to meet you. Sam. Sam, good to meet you too. So tell me about the game this evening. Who, who are you playing and how many aside? The All Stars. Yeah. And, and I'm playing six aside. Yeah. Right. What's your favourite team? Manchester United, hands down. Yes. <laughs> Sam, Cameron, Zach and Ben are 12 and 13 years old. They live in an outer metropolitan suburb and go to a local Anglican school. For boys so young, their worries are surprisingly grown up. What are your top...? I worry about some things like terrorism, racism and, like, poverty around the world and some diseases. Ben, how do you react to the news? Uh, I find I used to see a lo lot of, like, ISIS on it. Like, there used to be a lot of bombings with them and everything. I find that horrible. I, find, I just think, why did they do that? What did they do to you? There's a very clear sense that they feel they're about to be handed a poison chalice. And that is, I think, because of the immersive amount of news that we have now, the 24-7 cycle, where they see environmental degradation. You know, we see IS, we see the floods of migrants. And so they're left in that place of pain and bewilderment and these issues being much larger than they, they can personally deal with. Maggie Hamilton is a social researcher who specialises in child and adolescent development. In the last few years, she's interviewed hundreds of kids and spoken at length to teachers, doctors, parents and researchers. I saw some really disturbing things. Um, we're now seeing children as young as seven having to go into counselling for anxiety issues, eating issues, depression. One major cause of anxiety and depression in kids is family conflict and parents separating. I would like to have a positive and, ha positive and happy family in the future. Ben's parents split up when he was four. I don't remember much, but I remember, like, m my dad leaving me. Like, I remember that, I remember that. I remember how my mum and dad used to fight. How did it affect you emotionally at the time? It affected me a fair bit once I got to realise that's what happened. It, it affected me for like half a year, but then I got over it because that, that's about when I started playing soccer and that's when I started to get over things. That's how, that's why I get over things, by playing soccer, because I learned to get over, like, my dad and my mum leaving. And how are you now? I'm fine with it. Like, I see my dad at least once a week, and it's good. I haven't seen 
I haven't seen them fight in ages. So, yeah, it's good. Olivia is 12. She lives with her mother and younger brother, Will. Their parents are separated and Olivia has just changed schools. And so they're left in that place of pain and bewilderment and these issues being much larger than they, they can personally deal with. Maggie Hamilton is a social researcher who specialises in child and adolescent development. In the last few years, she's interviewed hundreds of kids and spoken at length to teachers, doctors, parents and researchers. I saw some really disturbing things. Um, we're now seeing children as young as seven having to go into counselling for anxiety issues, eating issues, depression. One major cause of anxiety and depression in kids is family conflict and parents separating. I would like to have a positive and, ha positive and happy family in the future. Ben's parents split up when he was four. I don't remember much, but I remember, like, my dad leaving me. Like, I remember that. I remember that. I remember how my mum and dad used to fight. How did it affect you emotionally at the time? It affected me a fair bit once I got to realise that's what happened. It, it affected me for, like, half a year. But then I got over it, because that, that's about when I started playing soccer. And that's when I started to get over things. That's how, that's why I get over things, by playing soccer. Because I learned to get over, like, my dad and my mum leaving. And how are you now? I'm fine with it. Like, I see my dad at least once a week, and it's good. I haven't seen, I haven't seen them fight in ages, so... Yeah, that's good. Olivia is 12. She lives with her mother and younger brother, Will. Their parents are separated and Olivia has just changed schools. You weren't very happy at your old school, were you? No. Tell me about that. I was bullied. I was teased because I wore glasses. Um, I was... Girls would, like, make me buy them, like, use my money to buy them, like, treats, like, like, like lollies and stuff from the school canteen. Um, and they'd say if I didn't, they would, like, for example, bite their arm, and have a bite mark, and then go tell the teacher that I bit them. So I felt that I really had to go and buy things for them. And it's, it's really horrible, but yeah, that's what I think. One of my friends that actually went to my school, she ended up with anorexia, which is absolutely horrible. And um, we were all there for her and everything like that, but she had to end up leaving my school because of that. What are we having tonight, Gabrielle? Mexican. It's okay. Mexican ones, yeah. Come on. Tell me what you want. As well as being pressured to look perfect, some girls are pressured by boys who learn about sex through pornography. I thought I could get away with it because I tried to wash it like really well, but yes. it didn't work. So I know there's some boys that do think that like oh, girls are just like kind of like sex toys, which is horrible, and they then go to parties and treat girls like that, and that's where um, you kind of have to be careful in a way like girls especially, but that's horrible. While all these kids have normal day-to-day -day anxieties, one dancer, Claudia, has really struggled. My parents got divorced this year and it wasn't an easy divorce either. And I've got a little sister, she's 13 years old. And when my parents divorced, I felt like I had to step up. I stepped up to be like, like a second mum to my sister. So, very strong for her, and it got to the point where it was re really bad, and she was going through, like, a depressed... Like, she was depressed for quite a while, and none of my parents knew, only I knew. I 
I was not motivated for anything. I couldn't get up. I didn't want to do anything. Like, even when I had my outdoor activities, like, it would be a struggle to go to them because I couldn't find the motivation to go. But, yeah, I got through that, so... Who helped you get through it? Oh, definitely my sister, 100%. She's always there for me through thick and thin, and I'll always be there for her, and she will for me. I know that for sure. It all took its toll on Claudia as well. I put on um, a lot of weight. I was not so much motivated as what I usually are. Um, School, my half yearly exams didn't go too well. Um, And yeah, just everything went downhill. But as soon as I hit term three, I really realised that I've got to focus on myself as well because I'm starting year 12 and I've only got one year left till I go into the future. So I cracked down on what I eat, I um, cracked down on my fitness, I really stepped up at school, handed my assessments in. Um, Yeah, I really like, I'm quite happy with myself at the moment. You know, from the large scale epidemiological studies that have been done around the world, that if you're experiencing depression, anxiety, drug and alcohol problems, eating disorders, and you're self-harming, you're at greater risk for suicide. Alicia and Ellie met in the same psych ward after attempting suicide. Both girls came to realise how taking their lives would have devastated their families. I guess the only thing that sort of kept me here was my brother and just the idea of that I didn't want to leave him alone in the world. Like, that was just such a selfish thing to do. And sort of like, you know, the repercussions it would have on my family. The main issue for me was that it's not fair on my family. Um, And I knew how much it would just ruin my parents and my brothers. Only now is Alicia coming to terms with the anxiety she felt about her place in the world. You know, you turn on the news and there's just all this horrible stuff happening and you go on Facebook and there are stories of, like, suicide and car crashes and, you know, everywhere you look there seems to be so much despair. And I think there's a lot of pressure put on our our generation, but I think there's sort of, like, this pressure put on us that we need to sort of, you know, we need to fix the world. And, like, I know personally for me, I'd sit and I'd watch the news, I'd look at these starving children and I'd look at, like, the state of the economy, I'd look at the mess that the world was in, I'd sort of feel like I had to change all of this and I felt so alone in doing that. And I think that people forget that, you know, they do have the ability to make that change and they don't have to feel so alone in the world. Most kids do survive their anxieties, and most go on to live a full and happy life. But it can be a daunting journey. There are no easy answers, but maybe listening more closely to what our kids are trying to tell us would be a good place to start. Their voice is just as important as a scientist. Their voice is just as important as a CEO because they have solutions that they know are going to resonate with other young people. Is there any advice you would give to parents in particular? Yeah, just ask them how their day was. It's not even that hard or that difficult. Just honestly ask them, how was school? How are you feeling? How are your friends? Um, Is there anything that's stressing you out? Um, what can we do to solve this? I have a mother who I can talk to anything about and no matter what it is. We're having to flee their homes and, like, parents being split up from their kids, it's pretty heart-wrenching. I worry about some things like terrorism, racism and, like, poverty around the world and some diseases. Ben, how do you react to the news? Uh... I find I used to see a lot of, like, ISIS on it. Like, there used to be a lot of bombings with them and everything. I find that horrible. I I just think, why did they do that? What did they do to you? There's a very clear sense that they feel they're about to be handed a poison chalice. 
And that is, I think, because of the immersive amount of news that we have now, the 24-7 cycle, where they see environmental degradation. You know, we see IS, we see the floods of migrants. And so they're left in that place of pain and bewilderment and these issues being much larger than they, they can personally deal with. Maggie Hamilton is a social researcher who specialises in child and adolescent development. In the last few years, she's interviewed hundreds of kids and spoken at length to teachers, doctors, parents and researchers. I saw some really disturbing things. Um, we're now seeing children as young as seven having to go into counselling for anxiety issues, eating issues, depression. One major cause of anxiety and depression in kids is family conflict and parents separating. I would like to have a positive and, ha positive and happy family in the future. Ben's parents split up when he was four. I don't remember much, but I remember, like, m my dad leaving me. Like, I remember that. I remember that. I remember how my mum and dad used to fight. How did it affect you emotionally at the time? It affected me a fair bit once I got to realise that's what happened. It, it affected me for, like, half a year. But then I got over it, because that, that's about when I started playing soccer. And that's when I started to get over things. That's how, that's why I get over things, by playing soccer. Because I learned to get over, like, my dad and my mum leaving. And how are you now? I'm fine with it. Like, I see my dad at least once a week, and it's good. I've, I, haven't seen, I haven't seen them fight in ages, so... Yeah, that's good. Olivia is 12. She lives with her mother and Eastern Seaboard in a small coastal town live these four 15-year-old schoolmates. It's an area of high unemployment and broken dreams, and their teachers are pushing them hard to succeed. Elora and Emma feel the pressure to do well at school. Being in like a top class, it puts like pressure on you to do like good and all the teachers put like pressure on you. I'm in the top class as well, so I feel pressure to like do really well and stuff and I get a lot of pressure off mum as well because she always wants me to do really good and there's like this really smart kid in my class <laughs> and I always... I, I can never be as smart as him, and it's really frustrating, but, yeah. Does that get you down? Yeah, it does. And lately I've been getting even worse, and it's really sad, <laughs> yeah. Tarquin feels the pressure just to keep up. I'm not in the, the smartest class out of all of them, so, like, assignments and just trying to do work in class, I kind of feel a bit, like, pressured because I really don't know much about what they're talking about to me, so I get a bit nervous and anxious about what if they, like, get angry at me because I haven't done it, but then I don't want to say them. I actually don't know how to do it, so I get scared and try to sit there and be quiet. Ethan constantly worries about his weight. It's hard having, like, such good-looking friends who've got, like, the best bodies and, like just swimming with, like, going to the pool with them and swimming and then they're all getting, like, shirtless photos and bikini photos and it's just so awkward, like, I'll just sneak around the back, get my shirt back on and, like, get back into the photos. But um, I've... I'm doing stuff about it. Like, I've lost seven kilos, so... Tell me why you felt the need to lose seven kilos. Um, I felt the need to lose weight, I guess. It's because... I just thought it was embarrassing to be around my friends when they were so, like, they had good bodies and I just felt like crap about mine. And seeing other people, like, people sharing photos on, like, Facebook and stuff, it's like, all anyone wants. And then it's like, people with abs and, like, the jawlines and stuff. And I don't know, it just made me feel like no one would, like, I'd grow old and just be lonely. But, um, 
I think at the moment I'm all right about how I am because of, like, again, my friend's support. 